worked his way up through various positions in the company. Uh, AJ took over the reins as CEO of Highland in 2001 and has enjoyed its fastest growth and, and most success over the last 10 years plus here in headquartered in Westlake, Ohio. Uh, his presentation today is entitled Entrepreneur Lessons for Tech Teams. This will offer you some insight on how your organization can utilize entrepreneurial, ugh, I knew I was going to mess it up, entrepreneurial, you know what I mean, traits to enhance operations, achieve more, and grow your IT team's impact on your overall business. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce AJ Highland. Hello, everybody. How you doing? Good. Good. You need to stand up and stretch at all? Why don't you do that? Why don't everybody just stand up? One side. Next side. Okay, that's great. <laughs> Good job. All right. Um, well, it certainly is an honor to be here, and I, and I want to thank Brad and, and the rest of the folks from Neosa and Cozy for, for having me out. Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk, talk to a group. It's a little out of my wheelhouse, though, because uh, usually when I'm in front of IT managers and CIOs, I'm, I'm trying to sell you something. Um, so this is a little different for me to, to talk a little bit about Highland without trying to sell you something. So rest assured you won't get a sales pitch, but if you would like one, um, I'm happy to do that afterwards as well. So. Um, Brad approached me with this interesting topic, talking about entrepreneurial lessons uh, for IT teams. As you know, I, when I said yes, I guess I didn't realize that's kind of challenging. How do you how do you incorporate sort of for a for you know the the corporate for profit entrepreneurial startup, and then how does that translate to IT groups uh, that are usually a, you know subset of, of a large organization? And uh, so I, I like that kind of challenge. And and uh, if you looked on the internet and did, did a search for entrepreneurial traits, you know, almost all the hits that you see, you know, top 10, top 50, you know, entrepreneurial traits, a lot of them are very, very similar. So uh, I wasn't going to spend my time talking about the, the normal ones, you know, vision, passion, focus, or I'll talk about passion a little bit, but, you know, vision, focus, and, some, and, and you know, persistence and all the things that you see from an entrepreneurial perspective. Um, I thought I'd look a little bit more at sort of Highland's history and, and maybe how some of the lessons that uh, of our of our growth uh, success here in Northeast Ohio and throughout the world and, and how that translates to uh, internal IT teams and, and what you may do there. So, so hope you stick with me on that and, and, and go from there. So I think there is relevance. The, uh, the first thing uh, when I looked objectively at, uh, at our success um, and, and profitability and growth over the last 20 years is, is, is number one, the diversification of skill sets among the leadership team. And I think this is a key component of one of the things that has really made Highland successful. And, and what I mean by that is that we had a lot of people, particularly early on, and then have been able to have the, the same type of uh, component uh, as we've grown, where we had a lot of diverse skill sets from the leadership team. And, and what happens, as, as you know, in a lot of these entrepreneurial stories, is there's, there's tremendous amount of peaks and valleys. There's lots of up times and down times. There's you know, lots of times where money's tight and customer problems, and there's times when things are growing and everything seems like it's you know, going perfectly. So you've got to be able to handle both of those. But uh, the interesting thing about us is that when we had the down times and the tough issues came up all the time, we had, a different, we, had a, we had a set of people that could each kind of handle whatever type of issue that was. And, and, um, you know, we didn't have four developers start the company, or we didn't have three accountants start the company. We had, um, you know, my brother who founded the company, he was sort of a customer relations and software ergonomics type guru. We had another gentleman who was a database and architecture guru. We had my, um, you know, we had a, f a finance guy who was really sound and solid. Uh, we had somebody who knew how to raise money uh, really well. And then you had, you know, we had a sales and marketing person. And, and it was interesting as we didn't have the um, artistic difference problems uh, early on, so I think that that's interesting. One 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 example of that is that m my father was particularly gifted at raising money. He was he was excited and energized about telling the Highland Software story, and and you know oftentimes he would come in in the morning and we'd sort of say, Hey, Dad, how you doing? We don't have uh, money for payroll today, so. Uh, you need to hop on the horse and, uh, and make sure that's in there in the account by 4 o'clock. And he would figure out a way to make that happen. Now, if you had given that test to me, um, I would have probably come back with like a roll of quarters or something and, and you know, not been able to do it. It's just not in my wheelhouse or skill set. But he was able to talk and able to do that and, and, and be successful. So we were, able to, we were able to do that. So what does this mean uh, to all of you? I really do think that, you know, from my perspective, regardless of the size of your team or your department and, and, and where you are now or where you're going, I think it's absolutely crucial to have a diverse set 
of skills within your leadership team. And that's you know, from an IT perspective and what you're trying to accomplish from your organizations, having different sets of people that can handle different sets of problems is great. And acknowledging that, you know, not, not one person can be everything to everybody. So uh, an example here is if you, if you spent time and, and had like four, you know, your leadership team was just four great strategists, well, that's probably pretty good. I mean, you're gonna be able to strategize and think about where you're going. But when it gets time to do stuff, um, you might struggle there. And then on the opposite end, if you have like, you know, four doers on your leadership team, um, you're probably going to get stuck in the weeds and a lot of strategic opportunities are going to float by and you won't be able to, to get that. So I think it's important to, to have a diverse set of people at the top level to, to make sure that it's going in the right direction. So another example at Highlanders, I would not, you know, consider myself a, a visionary by any stretch or a great strategist. I've gotten better over the years, but I've got a couple people that I work very close with who are particularly good at that. However, if you left some of the implementation up to them, we, nothing would get done. So I kind of step in and sell it to the company or, or, or get it moving and get it in, uh, implemented. And uh, you use those complementary skill sets within your leadership team to drive things forward. So um, I would just uh, suggest one of the things that you know, has made us, uh, from an entrepreneurial perspective, very successful was the diversification of that skill sets. And I do think that's relevant within IT organizations uh, as well. So one of the undertones of all of this, obviously, is, is having the, um, the humility and the wherewithal to understand that you do have limitations and, and understand that other people are going to have to fill those. So uh, I encourage IT managers and CIOs and any leader to really take the time to assess what they can and can't do and, and make sure you plug those holes with other leaders so you've got a group of people that can handle whatever comes your way. Uh, the second uh, aspect of entrepreneurial um, success, I think, that uh, doesn't get talked about enough, um, and I think has been a hallmark of Highland's customer service approach, has been accessibility. Um, when you think about all the great entrepreneurial stories, you know, those, those people start a lot of the great companies in the U.S. Or around the world. Many of them, you know, started off were, you know, extremely accessible and remained accessible to their customers, and I think that's something that's absolutely huge. It's been a, a boon for Highland and kept us uh, in tight with our customers, and we, we project that we want to know and understand uh, what they do. So. So my question is, you know, to, for, for you as IT leaders, does, does everyone within your organization um, know how to get a hold of you? Um, do, they, do they understand how to get in contact with you? And even more importantly, do they understand that it's okay to get in contact with you? So um, if you're building sort of the, you know, a, a layer between you and your people or gatekeepers or, or ways and avenues for people to get thwarted when they try to bring you ideas, that's a bit of a problem. You've got to create some avenues to, to, um, to create feedback uh, directly from from people. So one of the ways that, that we have done this and I've done some of this is um, and just some a couple tangible uh, recommendations is uh, create a, a program called round tables. It's really it's really interesting. What, what I've done is is created groups of people that that aren't management from a across the organization and, and just taking them off site or off off the corporate site and just sort of getting feedback about how things are going. And what I, what I might recommend to, to all of you is to do that as a CIO or as an IT manager to get a cross section of your employee base, non-management, non-peer level, and go, go somewhere and just say, hey, how are things going? Well, how are these solutions working for you? What can we do? And, and to sort of project that accessibility and start building those relationships across the organization. Um, one, of the, one of the goofy things that, that I've done in the past, I probably should do it more often than I do now, is, is I, I used to create like sort of uh, in, the, in, the, in the flow of the organization workspaces. So I would just get out of my office and put my desk right in the hallway. Um, or do things like that, and some of that just is a little bit goofy, but you know, you, people walk by, they stop and chat, you learn a lot, and do, little things like that can, can project this accessibility, because I think that's important. And uh, the most important thing about it is you learn what is and isn't working much quicker. Um, if you create a lot of bureaucracy and red tape to get feedback, you're probably not gonna hear what you need to hear so you can react as fast as possible and be the best IT organization for, for, your, for your company. So that's, that's critical. So I would just recommend highly the uh, maintain and project accessibility and make sure people know how to get a hold of you and that it certainly is okay to get a hold of all of you. The next one isn't uh, any, any, uh, any revolutionary point, but I think it's something that we did uh, particularly well, and I think it translates to IT groups as well. And that's sort of developing cheerleaders or creating stories um, about successes within your organization. You guys are under a tremendous amount 
of constraints. You know, finance wants you to do everything for less money. Uh, legal wants you to do everything for compliance. You know, your business owners want you to do everything yesterday, and none of them want anything to change in order to get there. So um, I don't envy uh, the spot that you're in, but you know, it is what it is. And, and one of the ways that you can help, uh, you know, get, get some some movement on some of the initiatives you want to go on is is to look and scour your organization for. Uh, those people that are champions and will be champions for you, whether it's a particular group or a particular individual, um, you want to find somebody who's willing to be, uh, you know, a champion for your cause and create create a story. And, and, and I suggest that one of the ways you do that is, is, you, is you get them involved. You, you, you kind of know your organization and some of the people that are willing to be more on the edge than others, and you sort of recruit them. You get them part of the process. They become so, sort of the uh, quick feedback loop and whether things are, are or not working, and then you quickly leverage them to, to help sell that story. And Highland's done that particularly well. I think Sherwin Williams was up here earlier, and uh, they were customer number 14 uh, for Highland Software. We now have over 12,000 customers almost, and they were customer number 14. And, and, to, and we were a 10 person company trying to sell other companies. You can bet that we leveraged a Fortune 500 organization using Highland Software and, and our on base product, and we talked about that. And to get there, we had to give a lot away. We gave a lot of time and a lot of software and, and discounted and everything else, but it was an investment in a champion and in a story to help propel us uh, further as an organization. So that, that, was, that was good. So um, one of the things that, that I've noticed about the, uh, the champion stuff is it's difficult to find that person. So uh, I think this ties back to the accessibility. The more you're out there and the more you're knowing your organization, the better you are to find those people that will take uh, you know, an initial process or a device or a solution or a system and work with you to, to create that story. And then obviously you want to use them to trumpet that cause and to be that cheerleader for you so you're not spending all your time trying to, uh, you know, push something through the company. You've got business leaders and other people in the organization helping you, helping you get there. So, all right, so those are some of the first three. And the last one really isn't, uh, once again, it's one of those common ones, but I think it's, it's absolutely crucial is, is from, a, uh, from a passion perspective. Um, you know, it really is important to, to approach, you know, your particular part of the world with a tremendous amount of passion. And, and the question is, do, do people within the company feel that passion on a daily basis? I think that's a, it's a really important question. And um, we have had a lot of passion for, for, for what we do. We, we generally care. Uh, and project that we care about the solutions that we provide to our customers. And I think what, if, you, if you asked our customers throughout history, what they liked most about Highland is that the, the people that they dealt with uh, were passionate about what they were doing, excited about what they were doing, and, uh, and, and showed that every single day. So um, I know that IT organizations are perceived and can be perceived as, 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 you know, as, as bureaucracy or can be perceived as cost centers, but I think that's a bunch of baloney. I think they're absolutely crucial to the success of the customers, to the success of attracting and retaining uh, and, and penetrating new markets and everything else. They're just a, a key part of every organization. So, um, but I think we have a long way to go from a perception perspective to, to fix that. So one of the things that, that, that I would you know, challenge everybody is, is do you understand you know, your business more than your marketing department? Um, you know, is your IT organization so up on the value proposition that you provide to your customers that you can become that trusted advisor internally to, to all the business units and say, hey, we're, you know, we really get what we're trying to do as a company and here's how what we're providing is going to take you uh, to that next level. So, um, you know, imagine their, their faces if, you know, IT is involved in a, in a conversation and, and you're able to talk about the competitors that are out there, talk about the customer situations, know the true and real value that you guys provide with whatever products and services you're bringing to market. Um, that, that would impress a lot of people. So it might be something where you, you know, you rally your troops to get more educated on what your business is doing and not just be a call center or not just be people that run around and fix systems or deploy solutions, be that trusted advisor. I know our internal group at Highland is, is trying to switch their mode from just being run around and fixing stuff and deploying solutions to being truly intertwined and, and integrated with each business unit and, and go from there. So, um, so that's, that's important there. Um, once you do, though, once you get that trusted advisor mode, I think it's just, it sort of creates a, a, nice, a nice avenue for, for further success. And uh, you know, if you understand that value proposition for your customers, you're going to be uh, more of a hero than you probably already are within your organization. So, um, so yes, I do believe there's, there's lots of entrepreneurial skills uh, 
uh, that you can use and leverage um, within your organization and within your IT group to help you uh, better serve, serve your company. And uh, I don't think a lot of people think of it that way. So I was, once again, I want to thank Brad for bringing up, bringing up that topic. So I guess my, my last challenge to all of you is to think about the four things that, that I spoke about. You know, do you have enough diversity in terms of skill sets within your leadership team to help you get to where you're going to go? So you can handle all the you know, various problems that come up, and you've got a, a good way of, of, of dealing with that. Do you make it known throughout your organization that you're accessible and you want to be accessible and you want to open up those feedback loops? Um, and then, obviously, create pockets of success and leverage those pockets of success for anything that you want to roll out and do as an organization. And then lastly, um, you know, be passionate about what you do. Generally care about not just your IT organization, but the success and goals, and tie all of that together uh, for, from a corporate perspective and, and do that. So um, with that, uh, I want to thank you for the time. And I'm, I'd love to answer any questions if you had them about, about Highland, these traits, uh, and anything else uh, that we have going on. So uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, being asked to be here. Oh, come on. I know I'm just an hors d'oeuvre, but come on. <laughs> Personal question, anything. Come on, let's work with me. Yes. I have a question. Um, Highland has a great reputation in town, and uh, it's a place that um, uh, your employees talk very favorably about the company and everything else. Can you just talk a little bit about the culture? You kind of touched on it. We talked about your desk in the hall and very accessible. But can you just elaborate a little bit more about that culture and why it's so attractive in the community? OK. Did everybody hear the question about the culture? I, I, I think that, well, thank you for that. Um, I think what we've, we've tried to do is, is create a place where you have um, underlying foundationally a very strong culture that has, just starts with like a respect for the individual. Um, that creates a good work-life balance, that um, people generally, as I said, feel passionate about and what we're doing for customers and are energized about process improvement and the solutions that we're providing. And then we try to layer on top of that some of the more like, you know, unique Silicon Valley or tech type things from, from, a, uh, from a culture perspective or an event perspective. And uh, we, have, you know, we have events for employees or ways for them to connect um, outside of the office or in the office in more of a social way to create those bonds and those relationships. But uh, we're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. You never hear me say from any podium that we are, we make our mistakes. But I think the key to all of this is a genuine interest and desire to be a great place for people to work. And I think that also starts with accessibility to senior management. You know, we have no ivory tower type stuff at Highland. You, everyone can see what everyone else is doing. It's an, it's an open clean environment. I think we all feel passionate about, as a team, winning in this, in this, in this marketplace. And um, you know, with that comes a lot of things. But I think uh, you know, certainly attracting and retaining people who get what we're trying to do from a core values perspective and a mission perspective, and then being extremely diligent about removing people who don't fit that mold. Um, I think what we learned early on is that when you try to um, go after rock stars and get the greatest you know, the greatest players on the planet that you think are the best, um, sometimes they just, they rock the culture and they come in a little bit, you know, too big, you know, too, too high in themselves or whatever it is, and that just doesn't work. And, and, and you, you sacrifice 20 great people who are energized and doing something by trying to bring in somebody who's, you know, going to take you over the top. So you got to be really careful about who you're bringing on. And then, you know, there are people who can dupe you in the process, so you just got to be really diligent about watching that. So it's, it's, it's getting the right people who, who buy in to what we're doing, but I think it's also having a solid foundation as an organization. And I would say very clearly it's about evolving all the time because you know, what I've explained to my HR team and my leadership team is that we, we do have some uh, nostalgic people uh, still there who like, like when we were you know, 100 people and it was a little bit easier to do stuff and get stuff done. But I was like, listen, we, we're affording our op opportunities here for a lot of people. We, we're responsible for a lot of jobs and a lot of families. And you've got to change your whole mentality to what can we do now that were bigger versus holding on to the past and just pushing for constant evolution on, and all that we do, product and corporation and culture and everything. So we're pretty excited. His, our historical turnover rate's been particularly low. We do have 
we have periods of spikes. This year's a bit of a spike higher than it was last year, and then you know, it, and we see we tend to see one of those every four years for whatever reason. It's very bizarre. We track it very very closely. In fact, I just came from my leadership meeting. We spend you know almost half hour to an hour talking about turnover, talking about trends, and 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 at least keeping it top of mind from leadership. So maybe that's part of it as well. So I think the goofy stuff and the fun stuff with the slides and the open environment and the you know the midday dodgeball games and all of those kind of things and uh, those get you know those get a lot of the press but I think that's just sort of icing on, on a foundation because if you're if you don't have the solid foundation you're caring about people that just becomes like the movie office space and you know that's not gonna help anybody so classic all-time tech movie if you haven't watched it so thank you for the question anyway, yes sir Oh, Mike, oh, one's back there, I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, I'm curious if, even with some short-term pain, if you encourage the entrepreneurial spirit of your employees. Uh, I, I know a few employees that have gone out to start other things. And I'm curious how you uh, either foster that or encourage that, even though it might be painful in the, in the short term of losing an employee or a, a few employees, actually. Yeah, we, uh, that's interesting. We have lost a decent amount of employees to uh, other uh, Northeast Ohio based startups and entrepreneurial things, which, you know, we take a little bit of pride in that they, you know, that we were able to, to foster those individuals. So uh, I think internally, though, we're not really encouraging people to think of like other products that, you know, they can go off and start their own companies necessarily. I, I think we're trying to build the innovation and, and encourage that internally about what we can further do for our customers or further processes that we can, uh, we can improve uh, with, within, our, within our company. And, and every once in a while, we have a, a couple people who, who have that entrepreneurial bug, which I love. You know, it, well, a lot of people do, but they, they, they make the next leap to, to do something as a startup. And uh, what I've encouraged every one of them that came to talk to me about where they're going, as I said, you know, just here's some things to keep in mind. And, and uh, from, from my perspective as a leader uh, in Highland, I want them to be successful. I take a lot of pride in having a former employee who does a lot of great things. That would be, that'd be great. And I've always kept that line of communication open with them if they have questions. But I just told them to get, get ready for some for, for get ready for the roller coaster. It's uh, it's it's a lot of fun. So, thank you. Quick question on um, you. You have an interesting culture as uh, you outlined there. But what is the number or the average years of service that your employees have? Mm. The average what? Years of service. Mm. Average years of service. Um, uh, at Highland, I mean their average time they've been at Highland. Correct. It's probably six years, six or seven years, probably. Um, the one problem is we keep on hiring a boatload of people that drags that down. We've already hired 216 people already this year, and we have 70 more starting on Monday. So it's just, yeah, we're, you know, that sort of drags our <laughs> drags that number down a little bit. But we also have a lot of very tenured uh, seasoned people like myself that have been there for, for some time. And uh, I'm proud of the fact that, that people have continue and choose to continue to, to build their careers there and, and continue to do. But I would guess the average is right around four or five years, which is usually from a HR perspective, that's when you run into your, you know, people start looking for other things and, 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 and doing that. So, but so I don't think we're abnormal in that regard. So what I'd like to be abnormal in is in the single digit historical turnover rate, which is important for us. All right. Over there. You can yell? Right. Oh, good. How, how do you go about um, spurring innovation in your industry? And how do you do that at your company? Kind of like Sashi was talking about how he's building a kind of a process to do that. Do you guys have something like that? We do. I think we could be much better at it than, than we are, to be, to be very blunt. I think we've, we've done a lot of things in the last couple of years that are starting to push that. We have a, 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 an internal site like they do. We have Innovation City, and you're allowed to, um, to uh, submit ideas and, and some innovations that you'd like to see in the company. The company can vote, you know, the old thumbs up, thumbs down, and what they think about it. If there's a certain percentage that, that, that believe it, so sometimes people campaign, but if there's a certain percentage that it goes over in terms of people that are for that idea, that either gets a sponsor at the executive level to present to, or we have what we call sort of a league of champions that, that you know, people in the organization that are highly regarded and innovative in their own right, and that they actually review a lot of those ideas and kind of pick which ones they think should be 
uh, should be pushed. Um, so that's more for internal ideas. It's not a lot on the product side. Um, we get so overwhelmed with ideas and innovations from our customer base, and we have long been an ear to the ground, really develop almost 80 to 90% of what we do based upon customer feedback, because we want to be developing things that they're actually going to buy and, and turn into revenue. So a lot of the innovation in the product comes from customers. Now we have a group of developers that also does some offshoot stuff and, and kind of you know tinkers and tries to move, move beyond and keep us on the edge there, but uh, a lot of the innovation is, is through this innovation city. And then, you know, I'm going to be, I've worked a lot with the leadership team, particularly my, my executive team, on how they're fostering innovation within their own departments. So we don't have a lot of stagnant or stale type ideas or, or processes. And just another example today, we were going over processes that have been out there for three to four years, and there's no reason to still do them the same way. So let's innovate, let's keep pushing forward. But yeah, I, think, I think a lot of that has to come to with the, the, the projection of the, of the senior leadership and what they're doing to try to push that. Uh, but you also have to have the grassroots stuff, which we've been done, we're doing a lot more of in the last 18 months. So are we all the way there yet? I don't think so, but we're, we're going in the right direction on that. But certainly opening it up to the organization and allowing them to, to give feedback and vote on that and creating the processes to filter the good ideas all the way up, I think is really important. And, and I also, there's also, it's also known that if you have an innovation idea, I will never turn you down. And, to come present directly to me on it. So uh, there, at least once a month, I'll have somebody sitting in my office saying, I think this is some, here's a trend I'm seeing. I had one two weeks ago, really interesting idea. We had one that was presented to me last, like nine months ago, that's now a full-fledged department with five people, you know, doing something different. So uh, that's, that's how we try to keep pushing it. Am I done? How am I doing on time? One more question. You're one of the few companies in the region of the tech companies that have really gone global. Uh, any roadblocks, any particular countries, interesting stories where your model just kind of flunked or really went well? Uh, the question, I just heard the question, sorry. I'm so used to repeating questions. Um, well, in terms of internationally, we, we have, uh, I would call that a, a, a long road of fits and starts. Um, to get there, and we we had a particular uh, success in Central and South America initially. Uh, one of the founders of Highlander, one of the initial two of the initial founders, are both of uh, both from Peru, Latin American sense. So we had a lot of energy towards that that area, and a lot of the product was in Spanish, probably even before it was in an English. Um, so we, you know we had some success there. I think that the toughest thing for us has been Europe, um, just dealing with the different. Um, cultural, you know, you, you know, mainland Europe versus you know UK and Ireland, you know, and and dealing with the differences there, and then each, you know, dealing with France versus Germany, it's really been a tough slog, and, and uh, we're not really well liked, you know, over there. So um, you know, so you have that uphill battle, and they love to buy from local. We we, we joke that document management companies must be a requirement in high school in Germany, like starting one because there's like 4,000 of them there, you know, so selling locally there is very, very difficult. So, so our strategies have been working with partners primarily, so uh, leveraging local expertise, and, and I would say that's the key thing if you're looking to go global, is you've got to find people that understand the business environment and that can go from there. And, and now we're up to the critical mass where we have almost 30 people in Europe right now from Highland. We have, I think, 12 people in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and we've got about 20 people in our Tokyo office right now. So we've seen, and actually our success in Pac Asia has been fairly, uh, fairly positive. And uh, the reason that was the matter is, is the three competitors of ours that went there before us totally torched themselves and did a terrible job. So we were kind of seen as a, you know, as a, as a great option for them. So it, it really d it depends on getting local expertise. And, and right now at Highland, we have almost 40 to 50 expats or, or people that are not non-Americans working at Highland, translating, doing support, and supporting our you know, hundreds of, almost thousands of international customers now. So it's, a, it's fun. All right, thank you very much for your time. Very much. Thank you.